My name is Julian Reed and I'm an artist theologian who makes beauty with words and music to amplify Jesus' sound. So I started out in music and in faith from a very, very young age, basically two, one and a half. I was in music class, I was in Bible study of some kind, according to my mom, and all of that then sped up as time went along into the love of piano, into the love of scripture, into the love of talking about faith, of thinking really at the intersection of faith and music, neither of which you can see, but both of which you can rely on. And because faith was always drawing me into conversations with the history of the church, I was always thinking with that kind of background in mind throughout growing up Growing up in Chicago, going to high school here, going to church here, uh, also playing on the music scene here in town. I was always thinking with that kind of history, that deep history of the church, but then also thinking growing up with the deep history of music in Chicago, blues, jazz, hip hop, classical, all the forms of music that this country holds sacred, you can find a version of here in the city. So since the beginning, Chicago has been such a great place for thinking about both. My mom was a pastor and she still is a pastor here in the city. And so I was growing up a PK, though she started when I went in high school, but still she was going to school for it. I was focused on my studies, but of course always attentive to her own trajectory. My mom also is a musician. She was, when I was younger, a semi-professional harpist. So I really got a lot of love for the music and the love for faith from what she gave all of us. So I ended up going to Yale University for my undergrad where I studied philosophy ultimately. But the funny thing about Yale was I knew I wanted to go there in part because I was interested in business initially. I did a bunch of business internships at banks here in Chicago and New York and learned over the course of that time that I really wanted to ask the deeper questions of life. Why were we here? What makes us tick? What gives us joy? What does faith look like? These were some of the questions that I really want to focus on and just the nature of the work was such I couldn't do that there. So that's why I ultimately pivoted from there and did something like philosophy, which I studied at Yale. Now, the interesting thing about music is that Yale had a robust art scene. Matter of fact, that's where I met my wife. I was the music director at church, at our church, Black Church at Yale, and she came and wanted to join the choir. And so that's how we got involved with each other. So that was one way that Yale really supported me. And I did the Yale Gospel Choir, and I also even had a trio. But the last thing I just said is a launch pad for a different way Yale helped me. Even though Yale did have a lot going for itself regarding music, it didn't have a lot actually in terms of formal jazz education. When I first got there, you could take a few classes on the cultural study of jazz, but you couldn't do much in terms of playing jazz for credit, there weren't a lot of institutions around campus that really shepherded jazz and nurtured it. But what Yale did have was a spirit of going after what it is you wanted and Yale supporting that. And so I had ultimately a working trio that was playing all around campus, that was gigging in dining halls and playing at parties for people. Man, we had a lot of work. And that taught me a lot about what was possible with music, about how music doesn't ask for permission but rather asks about what's possible. And because I sought to ask the second question more than the first, I wasn't deterred by the fact that I didn't see a bunch of other jazz trios working around campus. I instead just wanted to make the music happen and that ended up being the case. The last thing I'll say is that, again, keeping with the spirit of Yale serving the needs of their students, I was able to do two dope music ventures that were original by the end of my time. I was talking with a grad student and this grad student recommended that the Jazz Collective, which was a student-led grassroots organization for undergrads, have a jazz festival on International Jazz Day in April. And I said, what a great idea. So I don't know if it actually ended up happening on that day, but we ended up having the first inaugural jazz festival, the Yale Undergrad Jazz Collective, 
had that and it was amazing we got vj Iyer. i got to drive him around town and we got all of the kinds of cats to come in and play uh and it was amazing to have yale alumni but then also other cats come in and it was just a very special time but then the second thing and that by the way continues to happen to this day they still have the festival yearly so i was really i was really proud to be a part of that opening venture and you know in large part because of what Addie, this grad student suggested but then the second was right after I graduated, I had this idea to go on this tour around the world with this magician, Kent Koga, who was a year behind me. And we called it Joker and King, Julian, Kenta. And he did magic tricks with cards and the like. And I played piano. And we went to London, Istanbul, and Tokyo. And it was so fired going to these places. And Yale shot a video on us. and. We got to experiment with what it meant for me to play solo piano in a way that narrated experiences. And that ended up helping me get to where I am today with Notes of Rest and the Juju Exchange. So all these experiences kind of fit together and Yale not only provided resources and a space to play, but also the people to support me in my vision and to experiment with me. I ended up becoming a campus minister at Yale after I graduated. Looking back, it makes perfect sense that that would have happened. But at the time, I was actually pretty surprised that that ended up being the path out of Yale for me. And in fact, it was one I kind of struggled with because I had gone into Yale with these lofty aspirations of going into business or maybe going into fin uh, well, finance or law or consulting, politics, all of the kind of big in your face professions that you see a lot of Yaleys go into afterwards. But God had a different plan. And as I started to sit with these internships out of finance, sit with my musical experiences, I started to really want to ask deep questions of life. And then the community around me was like, you know what, you should consider doing ministry. Just give it a try at least to try it out. And because I was already involved with this campus fellowship, it then allowed me a chance to easily become onboarded into the other side, that is, as a minister serving the campus as opposed to being a student being served by the ministry. And so I did that for three years. I worked for InterVarsity Christian Fellowship for three years and also concurrent with one of those years on staff, I was a campus pastor for the church where Carmen, my wife and I met as undergrad, Black Church of Yale. So for three years, I was serving Yale in these two capacities, moving between being a campus minister, doing stuff throughout the week, Bible studies, getting lunch with people, talking about questions of faith, playing little music services with folk. But then also on Sundays for one year, I was also a pastor. And so the overlap between those two calls really allowed me a chance to start seeing what God had for me in terms of being a pastoral figure in people's life. But it would take a while for me to figure out how that would really connect with my music. At the end of my time as a campus minister, something beautiful happened. I got married and moving into that last year of staff was also moving into the first year of our marriage. And so now we were thinking even more directly about how our paths affected each other. I'm not sure I would have necessarily thought about going to seminary had it not been for Carmen wanting to go to medical school. Because she was going back to school, part of me was like, well, I could stay here and keep doing the campus ministry work that I've been doing. But part of me actually really does want a more formal dive into theological education, understanding more of the history. You saw the books on my shelf. And so I applied to school. And we ultimately ended up going to Candler School of Theology for me, Emory Medical School for her, both of which are part of Emory. So it was great to be at Emory for four years in Atlanta. And part of what happened that was so important in my formation there was I also started the band, the Juju Exchange. And that was kind of started in spite of me. <laughs> as opposed to because of me, because I wasn't planning on starting a band. The last thing I wanted to do was start seminary and a whole business, so to speak, at the same time. And yet, Nico and I got connected again. Nico's a trumpet player in the band. Nico and I got connected at my wedding 
the year prior and we stayed in touch and decided to just get together to make music over that summer before seminary started. And so when I went out there to LA to work in the studio with him, he was so excited and actually wanted to start something official. And that was not my intent and at the time. But I didn't want to close it because it just seemed special. It seemed unique. It seemed easy. We had worked together and been friends since high school. So now we're getting connected basically a decade after our relationship had started. And we were starting to really think about what it meant to make music as adults together. And so because I was doing music at this level now with somebody who had had such a prolific career, had won a Grammy, had done all this work with Chance the Rapper, it was really making me think about music formally in a different way than I ever had before, because I always wanted to do music, but it was always, to my understanding, as something that was going to live somewhat on the side of whatever it was I did formally, finance once, ministry then, etc. So I get into seminary, I'm moving along the track, taking all the classes, just enjoying the time, having the time of my life studying. But then also there was this question that was starting to move through my head about what juju was actually meant to be. And so I started to then see my time in school as related to my time in Juju, as opposed to them being just utterly separate entities. And as I started thinking about them together, I started to reflect on what it meant to be a minister who used music as a means of connecting with people, of getting in the same room as people to then have certain conversations with words with them. So the time in seminary was heavily influenced by how the music was giving me space to have this other kind of expression. And then I was able to meld them because of Candler's interdisciplinary focus. I was able to meld the two in beautiful ways throughout my time in various classes, doing experimental papers and whatnot, and just having a, a lot of fun getting to, to think about theology and ministry through this prism of music. While I was in seminary, I started to have this synergy of business, faith, and music. And it's during that that I really started to feel this sense of wholeness in a new way because I saw all three on the table. Whereas before finance was over here, and then my study of philosophy in undergrad was over here, and then my jazz trio stuff was over there. Now we're starting to see the three really start to merge as I'm thinking formally about academic study with theology. And then also thinking formally about business because the Juju Exchange as a band is a business. So that was making me feel really excited about what it meant to have this kind of fusion in my life, this synthesis. And that's where Notes of Rest came in. Notes of Rest is a Christian spiritual mini retreat I'd have that melds reading scripture and asking questions from it with live piano playing. And I do that for the sake of rest, contemplation and creativity. I have probably been practicing the elements of Notes of Rest all my life, just like I've been practicing the elements of the Juju Exchange all my life. But Notes of Rest, like Juju, needed to have time to mature in my mind and in my soul for it to come forth as this retreat that it now is. And so during my time at Candler, I was trying to play in chapel a lot. I was playing and I was meditating a lot and was reflecting deeply on the faith and loved reading scripture and loved talking about it. But it took some time after school for me to then realize that this could actually be a formal offering to the world. And so Notes of Rest moves in and out of all the spaces that I care for. I give these sessions for churches. I offer these sessions for seminaries. I offer these sessions for affinity groups. So you can gather a group of lawyers together, doctors, artists. You can gather all kinds of groups together and I'll take them through a passage of scripture that pertains to their group, to their identity. And then I'll play music and allow you to reflect on the questions as I play for you. Then I come back and ask you more questions. Then I play for you again. Then we talk about what happened for you. And then we get to create together as a result of what had happened in the time of my playing, in the time of my questioning, and in the time of your responding. So it's a beautiful hour long, thick time, and it's been amazing to do this with all kinds of people, um, the country over really, across countries. I mean, I've done it with people who've joined Zoom calls from Canada. And so I love Notes of Rest because now it really complements the Juju Exchange. Whereas in Notes of Rest, I'm playing hymns, I'm just focusing on material that already exists, scripture that already exists, music that already exists, because I'm just playing hymns of the church. 
in the Juju Exchange, I am making only original stuff. So I love being able to give you both. And if you listen to the life of this here artist theologian, you then get access to both of these, both the reflection on the traditions that we have from before, but then also innovations of the new. And so that's why I'm so thankful I have the two to interface with each other. The Juju Exchange is an experience, yo. It comprises me, Nova Zai, and Nico Segal. We're three Chicago friends who grew up together in the city, playing jazz together, playing all kinds of sounds together. And now we're making sounds that blend acoustic and digital sounds for the sake of cultivating wonder and trust in all who will listen. So that is what we're about we call ourselves a juju exchange because we're also about the exchange between cultures the exchange between acoustic and electric the exchange between black and white the exchange between various kinds of histories that are present in music and that all comes forth in our sound the juju exchange so we are really excited for our first full-length record that's coming out this year and hope that everything that we do draws people into this moving back and forth between these various histories, between everything that's exchanging. Something that's core to our sound, core to our system of belief and our approach to making music is that we are always exchanging. We're always exchanging. COVID has shown us that sadly, but we're doing that anyway in good ways as well. We're exchanging germs, we're exchanging dreams, we exchange insecurities, we exchange hopes and fears. All of that is being exchanged. And the extent to which we're able to really appreciate and recognize how we exchange will determine the extent to which we can find means of joining, means of intimacy, of accountability and growth. In August of last year, we had the privilege of sharing with the world the Eternal Boombox EP. And we offered that as a means of helping all of us, the band included, move through the time of deep grieving that we were doing in the midst of this chaotic pandemic that was continuing to unfold. People were losing a lot. And as a result of loss, whenever we lose, grief needed to happen. And so we wanted to offer the project as a means of helping mark that point in time as a place to move through all the stages of grief. So the five track project actually corresponds to each stage of the grief process per this theory of grief being broken down into the stages of shock slash denial, anger, bargaining, depression, and then acceptance slash hope. We had a music video that also came out to accompany that to give voice to how you can see in the music elements of all these emotional stages. And so wherever you were or are on the journey, we were hopeful that you could move towards hope, but then also feel comforted as you continue to wrestle with anger if you came back to that, or denial if you came back to that, or bargaining or depression. So that was the project. It was a beautiful offering that we're very, very proud to have given and continues to inspire people. One really special story about that was a couple of months ago, Nico was at a spot here in town and somebody walked in and once they learned of who Nico was, they started talking to Nico about how special the record was, how the record had helped them through depression, through their grief, through their trials. And they started weeping in front of Nico. I never met him. And so I was so thankful to have learned about this story from Nico because it showed me that the music we were making was really accompanying people through all that they were continuing to wrestle with, to cope with, and to try to find a, a new normal in the midst of. So that's what it was. And hopefully, no matter the season of life that you listen to it in, that's what it can, can continue to be. So we have a project that's coming up that's going to be forthcoming in the next year or so. We're really excited about it, but it's going to be a surprise what it's called because we really want you to be able to focus on it when it comes. So stay tuned for that. But short of that, we will say that the record will speak to our maturation as a band. We have two projects out, Exchange and the Eternal Boombox EP. And both of those were projects that were moving us just deeper into ourselves, trying to get a sense of our sound, we're a trio now. Our band mate, who was a bass player, moved on. And so we've also been able to really focus in on this trio identity and think about who we are, Nico, Nova, and me. How are we moving as people together in this group? So 
I'm excited for you all to get that sound, not only as we think about the internal exchange amongst us three, but then all the outside voices that we're bringing in to the exchange as well. So stay tuned. To know me is to know that I think about you. And to know me is to know that I'm going to have joy about you. To know me is to know that I'm going to look for the gifts in you. To know me is to know that I'm going to pray for you. This is Julian Reed. I'm an artist theologian, and you're watching Profiles.